the plan here is to go until 1035. And I realize when you have a smaller group um, that it's a little bit easier to relate to you all. So I'll try to take up all of the 1035 time and leave some room for any discussion, questions, things of that sort. So just by sake of just me getting to know you all, if you're able, um, if, if you work in a space that's connected to college students or higher education in general, by show of hands, uh, let me know. Okay, good. this will be a session for many of the things you've seen. I was hoping there would be maybe a few K-12 people here just to see kind of ahead of the, the game what's happening, but I, I feel most comfortable talking to people who work in the higher ed space. So before I get started, I want to first give some thank yous. Christy, I didn't know you were going to be in the audience, but I already written your name on the sheet here, Christy Ford at DCL for inviting me. Um, and if you see Olivia, please tell Olivia thank you for making this a very, very easy trip. And thank you to all of you. Uh, as someone who works for a national organization that does a lot of conferences, for you all to come to a session on the last day right before the end, that means you really want to talk about student success. And so it seems like a captive audience, the perfect one for me. And uh, just so we get to know each other, how many of you like to cook or bake or do anything in the kitchen? Okay, good. So this would probably be two things. Uh, my analogy that I'm going to use throughout this whole thing is going to be a play on the word fusion, the theme of the event, and also this idea of a recipe, the, the key ingredients that it takes to help us reach a particular goal. It might be to bake a great, really great pie, or it might be to uh, make a great steak, or um, even ice cream, which I really like a lot. So uh, you'll probably find that at the end of this, you'll be very hungry, or you'll have a really good through line about the, the connection between recipes for success and students and all of that. So I'm going to dive right in, assuming that this... Okay, we'll, we'll try that. Okay. So here's the agenda. I'll tell you some things about me. The headline is that I work in higher education. I've been in the field about 20 years, but there's some things about me that really undergird who I am and how I approach my work that you probably won't, <coughs> won't see in my bio. And I mentioned these things to you just for us to get to know each other and to show you that I think anybody's journey, regardless of where you start, if it involves college's uh, impact on you, I feel like it's a great place to be. So I'll give some definitions for our discussion and then I'll jump into some current trends in higher education. So when I ask if any of you work in the field or connect to college students, it's really just a level set and make sure we're all seeing the same thing in the same way. And then I'll give you what I think, uh, according to ChatGPT, uh, are the indicators of a good recipe. And then I'll dive straight into four elements. And the four elements will be very easy. So if there is anybody in here who's not necessarily working on a campus, these four elements, I think, in any conversation in relation to student success, you would find to be pretty relevant. And then I'll leave you with some additional considerations, some resources, and hopefully at least 10 minutes for us to have a conversation. Some reactions, questions, thoughts, um, ideas that you might have. So about me, uh, if you meet me within the first five minutes, I'm going to tell you about that picture in the upper left. That's my puppy, Marcus, uh, my first puppy. Um, if any of you have ever had a puppy or ever known somebody with a puppy, it's a learning curve beyond uh, description. I had so many things I didn't know. He just turned one, and so I, I think I deserve the gold star of achievement uh, for, for learning everything that the, the, the books don't tell you. I put it like that. I Google something every day. Uh, upper right is a picture of a farm, which represents my upbringing in rural Lake City, Florida. So it's right where I-10 and I-75 meet, if you're familiar with Florida. And I put that picture up there because I was that first generation low-income student um, who didn't realize that I was first generation or low-income. And so I don't like the idea that those would be setbacks, but instead something that kind of frames how you approach work and how you approach life. And so growing up on a farm, we learned to be resourceful. We learned how to do really great planning at certain times of the year. Uh, most people don't believe that I know how to you know, feed chickens and the, the crops and how to plant tomatoes from scratch and things like that. Uh, the bottom left is because I'm taking Spanish lessons and it is one of the most humbling experiences. I really enjoy being on stages where I can talk in English and present and meet new people. But when I'm with my one-on-one -on -one, uh, instructor, Alejandro, who's in Venezuela, I am now regulated to saying I have a dog. I like ice cream. Um, Friday is my favorite day of the week, which is like a long sentence to say, but very, very hard. So. Bottom right is I eat a, a little bit of ice cream every day. Now, I didn't get it when I'm here because I'm out of town, but really every day in the evening, I have a bowl of ice cream or an ice cream pop, something like that. Uh, when I was younger, my grandmother would always use that as a time of the day to celebrate what you had done. And so I have a huge optimistic thread that runs through my personality. So when I say I'm an optimist, I really am not naive. It's not that I think that anything is you know, um, gonna be hard to the point we can't do it, but I just really feel like, you know, there's a bright spot in most situations. So you'll hear me present some things about higher education that are really tough, but at the core, I think this is a really opportune time for us to be in education at any level. So I'm a researcher. My preparation is to dig into the big, big questions and find out what's going on. I'm a connector, so if all of you are here and you wanna hang around and talk a little bit, I'd be glad to meet you, or online if you're on LinkedIn or the socials and some, some Rebecca. And I hope that you will consider me a friend. So we're meeting for the first time today, but maybe we'll be at another conference sometime soon. So why did I tell you all that? Because we have a lot to discuss that might not be so 
positive, I guess, but I promise I'm going to leave us in a good space. So what's going on? You raised your hand and said you're working in higher education. So I tested these slides out with my sister, and she said, that's too much text. You're giving them too much. You're just way too much for the beginning of the session. I said, no, it's not too much, because that kind of describes what we're dealing with in higher education right now. So if somebody were to say, what's going on? What are the current issues? I usually start off, and this is in no particular order, but I start off by saying that the cost of a college experience continues to rise. There's no shocker there, but the cost could be in a lot of different ways. The cost of the individual, the cost of the campus, the cost of those who are funders, the cost of those who are administrators. The cost of a college experience continues to rise, and that's kind of what undergirds a lot of what we're talking about. Uh, don't have to tell you that the political involvement and influence is increasing, regardless of how you feel about the recent Supreme Court decision. They are involved. It's happening at states, it's happening at the federal level, it's happening at the department. And so that does kind of shape how campuses approach everything from admissions to free speech to campus safety and a lot of other things. As a result, institutions are also strained with capacity to holistically address students' needs. And so when I'm not at the D2L uh, meeting, I'm usually working at NASPA. And NASPA is a national membership association for student services or student affairs, student life, that type of function. So it includes everything from housing to advising to conduct and so on and so forth. And a lot of those professionals would say, we are strained. We are tired. During the pandemic, they worked long hours. They stayed on campus and never left. And so as a result, you're seeing things like the great resignation or the great regret, as some would call it. And it's really hard to provide holistic support to students when you don't have as much capacity. So remember I told you I'm an optimist, but not easily you know, into that space all the time. This is that part that's going to be really tough. Career preparation is becoming more of a shared responsibility. So when I look at campuses and what they're investing in, I see a movement in both directions in career services. So some campuses care so much about the outcomes of students getting a job, they take that out of student life. They say we need a whole separate center for career advancement. Others say it's so important that it be connected to students' academic progress, they put it within student services. Regardless of where it situates itself on the campus, career services and this idea that you go to college to get a job is pretty paramount these days. But let's say that somebody says, I don't necessarily want to go to college for four years. I want to do something different. I think the upskilling, the credentials movement discussion that other employers might be providing credentials, that's happening right now, too. Whew, are you all tired, Jay? There's a lot going on. Yeah. Artificial intelligence, sparking all kinds of conversations about efficiency and authenticity. Uh, did you all see the news? There might be the first investigation in the chat GPT asking about what they're doing. And so I put efficiency because the doomsdayers would say that AI is going to replace all of our jobs and we're going to become extinct. On the other side, they would say it would make us more efficient. Uh, you know, Christy recently did a, a really great podcast on AI and asked about how this might affect teaching and learning. And I'm, I'm more optimistic than most. And I think that in some ways we'll probably have a really steep learning curve, but I'm not so afraid of what it will do for us. It reminds me of back when the internet first came around and everybody was afraid of it. So I think we have some growing to do, but I don't think it's going to be so bad. Uh, what probably will be a little difficult is enrollment. Um, it's really hard to project. And if you've heard of the book, um, The Demographics of Higher Education, it's predicting that by 2025, the number of traditionally aged high school students that would go to college is going to be significantly less. And so most campuses on average might experience 15 to 20% decline, which is really tough. And so with all of that in mind, what do we do? I find a lot of campuses are saying they're moving from predicting student outcomes to now prescribing certain interventions. So if we know that we're going to have fewer students, what should we do to ensure that they actually stay with us longer and how can we get involved at a faster clip? I hit you with a lot. Those are all the issues and we could probably double the list there. But I want to get to a place where I move us into a discussion of what we can actually do about it. And so I did some Googling and it's really hard to find an article when you put in a search of do people think college is valuable? Do they think college is worth it? Because these days a lot of people have something to say about whether college is actually worth it. But I did find one. I was looking for some good news. And so Stephanie and Zach actually did a study. They work at Gallup and it looked at whether or not students say that their degree is actually worth the cost. And so what they seem to think in a no particular um, context, I would say, other than to say that probably on more public institutions, the numbers are a little bit lower, but kind of evenly between public and private, they seem to think that in this particular order of importance, the number one thing that they care most about to say if it's worth the cost is their preparation for life after college. That makes sense. Now, my debate would probably say life and college seem to be a little bit more intertwined, so it's no longer this thing that you would go to college and stay there for a small period of time in a bubble and then go off into the real world. I think the world is kind of connected to college now, but that makes sense. Um, the ability to express oneself freely on campus, I think that's huge. The extent to which they have the opportunity to interact with people with different views, their perceptions of physical safety, sense of belonging, these are all things you probably would expect. But what I would say from here is that if we know that this is what they're expecting in order to say that their college degree is worth it, we, as those who are probably engaging with them, have a lot of work to do. And you might say, well, what is the recipe for us to do that? 
So this is the part where I got literal and took the words fusion and recipe. And I, I know that you know what these words are, but I wanted to break them down just for our discussion. So I think you'll start to see a little bit of a through line of this very cheesy analogy that's gonna relate to food and hopefully have you a little hungry by the time we're done. So fusion, the process of uh, resulting of joining two or more things together to form a single entity, or referring to food and cooking and, and incorporating elements of diverse cuisines. And so on the side of the recipe, a set of instructions or something that's supposed to lead to a particular outcome. And so, I decided to get creative a little bit, and so we got the pizza here. How do you know when a recipe is good? And so I'm trying to make it now the through line to say, if we know what students are saying that they want, we know that we can provide certain different interventions and approaches to serving them, how do you know if the sequence of events that you're doing, how do you know the investments that you've made, the personnel decisions that you've made, how do you know when a recipe is good? So um, I won't ask anybody to tell me if you try GPT, but just if curiosity got you, I had to do it. So I put it in the prompt, literally, how do you know if you have a good recipe? And this is the result. I'm trying to do it in a, in a voice and pretend they were determining whether a recipe is good or not. It's subjective. It can vary depending on individual preferences. However, there are several indicators that can help you assess the quality of a recipe. So, duh, I get that part. This is what it said, literally. These particular indicators of a good recipe. So flavor, you know what that is. Texture, clarity of accuracy of instructions, ingredients and proportions, reproducibility, feedback and reviews, and personal satisfaction. I'd say if you have all those things, it's a pretty good recipe. If I wanted to have a, a banana bread recipe and I had all those things, it would probably be pretty good. But to try to make the connection between that and serving students, okay, I'll pause so you can take a picture. Sorry for the extra text. This is where I'm going to break it down to what I'd say are indicators of a good recipe for student-centered design. So when we say flavor, most often we think if the potato salad is good, I want to go back for some more. If the steak is really good, I want another piece. If the campus climate is in, inviting and welcoming and affirming of a student's identities, whichever ones they hold, you would probably say, I think that's a really good flavor and feel of the campus. There are a lot of campuses now that are looking at campus climate in a variety of ways. And I think at the core, the reason why someone would stay or not stay is because they don't feel welcome or they do feel welcome. So flavor to me equals campus climate. Texture, if you're thinking about the, the crumbling of a cookie or the crust around a piece of a banana bear or a really good cake, I would say that equals goal completion. The idea that if you know that the cookie, the ginger cookie should snap when you try to break it, the idea is that when students come to campus, they have very specific goals. And so I could just put degree completion here, but there's more to it. You want students to actually make meaningful relationships. You want them to develop expertise in a particular area. You want them to have some aspirations for the future, things of that sort. So texture to me equals goal completion. Clarity and accuracy of instructions, the idea that basically if someone didn't know you, could they take a set of written instructions and follow that to a T and actually get to the end goal? I think that relates to strategic communication and sending clear messages to students about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Reproducibility literally means scale. The idea, could you do it over and over and over? But what I say here is providing high quality program services and instruction across the institution. So not just within academic affairs, student affairs, other areas, of course. Ingredients and proportions, uh, I like to call that interactivity mix. And so it's the right amount of sugar, the right amount of baking powder, the right amount of salt, the right amount of pepper. In this case, you're talking about proactive, just in time, and tailored support. And that's a really hard mix to manage because you might be using a chat bot in some cases, or you might have one-on-one -on -one support in another, or you might have peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, things of that sort. Trying to get the right mix and proportion of resources to students at the same time is a little bit tough, but I think it's necessary for a good recipe for design. And if that's not enough, feedback and reviews. I would call that ongoing assessment. So the idea that at some point there are gonna be opportunities for improvement or opportunities to change some things. And so that usually comes from someone tasting that recipe and saying, hey, had a little too much vanilla, I wouldn't have done it that way. Or someone saying, hey, have you ever tried to swap this for that? I think if you've ever baked, you know that you can swap out applesauce for certain things. Or if you run out of eggs, you can do some things. So we could talk about that. And then lastly, personal satisfaction. To me, that equals celebration. Recognizing that progress is gonna happen for all students at some point, we have to celebrate that. So you all still with me? Some, some natural connections here between the recipe. All right, so I've set the stage. If we know what college students are expecting, that list of seven things, and we know how to address their needs, what are the elements that are critical to ensure their success? So these four things I'm gonna give to you are actually pretty simple. They're not really earth shattering or groundbreaking, but I think in today's climate, given that long list of current issues and challenges we're dealing with, these four things are essential. If I'm a college student today, I would need these four things to be present on my campus experience in order for that to happen. So I built it up and I'm calling it the recipe for fusing students' experiences and expectations with what campuses have to provide. In other words, their capacities. All right, strategic communication. 
Let me pause here. I've lectured you all probably this is strong 20, maybe 15 minutes, and time to have a little interaction. So by show of hands, if you're able, um, would you say, thinking back, regardless of how long it was ago, that your college experience as an undergraduate was successful? Don't overthink it, but if it's yes, maybe you raise your hand. OK. For those who raised your hand, uh, maybe keep them up. Put your hand down if it was because you got a job after. OK, so that, that wasn't the reason. OK, keep them up. If the reason was that you made friends or connections that you keep, no. If it was that you learned something that you feel like was life changing, OK. If it was that you, you found your deepest passion that you want to pursue, OK. Got a couple more hands. So if you don't mind, why did you keep your hand up? What was the reason if it wasn't one of those things? You don't know? <laughs> but that didn't touch on it? Anybody else? Is there a reason other than career, connections, or possibly de de determining your desires and passions for a career that you might mention? Graduating. Graduating. Typically, when we talk to campuses, presidents, vice presidents, we ask them, what is your definition of student success? Most often, and you, you, I mean, I didn't plant this, so I didn't expect you to say that, but it was the perfect answer. Every time I talk to a college president or vice president, I say, what's your definition of success? Most often, in the first response, they say, persistence, graduation or retention. And that makes total sense. Nobody could get away from that. You would never be able to make it as an administrator and say, we don't care about persistence, graduation, retention. But more often than not, we see the headlines that say, I got this degree, but I don't know what I can do with it. Or I got this degree and it costs too much. And I, in my optimistic self, find that to be a very challenging thing to sit with. Yes, we need students to finish, but we have to have some other way of describing success. So, uh, most recently, and this is the only, the second time I've talked about this, uh, so I just created this updated definition of student success uh, about three weeks ago. So I want to share it with you all, see what you think. I hope you don't laugh at me. Look at this. All right, so student success. We keep the goal of retention, persistence, and graduation. But what I'm saying is, rather than try to describe student success for every single campus the exact same way, I want to flip it and ask you all to think about the question I just asked you all. So this will be a part, I see some, some pictures up. The question really is, what does a successful student know how to do? And so back in 2018, I described four things, and I realized that it was a fine definition, but I've been wrestling with this thing, y'all. I can't work in a, an association that focuses on student success for college and not think about this. So here is my updated definition of student success. Now, I would love you all's feedback if you feel like something is missing, but this is what I think, and I think this happens in a bit of a linear fashion. So at the core, Students today, and I don't necessarily mean traditionally aged students only, any learner who's in a higher education environment, they are going to be interpreting information from multiple sources, and they're trying to figure out which information they should use to make a decision. And that means in their coursework, in their conversations with their friends, in their clubs and activities, in their other engagements, online searching, reading the news, they're interpreting and receiving information of all types. I think we've all been there and it's easy to overlook, but when that's happening, this is a time for you to develop that actual expertise on how to distill information, figure out what to keep, what to put to the side. They should be able to realize the scope and scale of various political, social, economic, health, educational, and other systems. Now, five years ago, I probably wouldn't have called it that so specifically, but given that everything that's happening across the world is connected, this is the time for today's learners to see all this happening in an ecosystem. So we're here at D2L, mostly talking about education. But what happens in education impacts health. What happens in health happens to affect finance and so on and so forth. I could say that a successful student today should realize the scope, meaning how far does this reach across systems, and the scale, the number of people it impacts, which is pretty much everybody, and what to do with that. Now at that point, imagine you're newly into college and you've started to get all this information, you've got some assigned reading, you're meeting people who have different views politically, different social engagements, you're exposed to a lot, making a lot of decisions, you're reading the news, you're watching TV, you're seeing a lot of things, you're on social media. At some point, the student's gonna say, what am I gonna do about it? I'm in this program, I'm trying to get this credential, I wanna graduate, but I'm not necessarily sure what I wanna do. I oftentimes hear people say college is a time of self-exploration. And I'll say, if you were to dig into my history, you know I took a little extra time in college and undergrad and I had a great time and I don't regret that. And the narrative of just figure it out along the way is very expensive now. I can truly say I came along at a time when the number of excess hours you could take didn't cost nearly as much as it costs right now. So this idea that you could let students kind of flounder and not worry so much, I think it's okay for them to commit like literally commit to a self-authored mission statement that guides the professional and personal aspirations. And what I mean by that is write it in a way that says, as of today, based on all the information I'm interpreting, based on all the realizations I have about what's going on, here is what I want to do to make an impact in the world, and here's how college is gonna help me. I think it's okay for that mission statement to change, but for right now to commit to something is a really bold step. 
And then lastly, to develop expertise. I, I think you probably knew this was coming. We can't say just come to college and write down your goals. At some point, you have to develop expertise in something that's going to give you a pathway to be earning a wage that can help you take care of your basic needs. And so what I would say is I see this as a bit of a continuum. So you start off by receiving all the information. At some point, you realize the scope and scale of things. Then you want to do something about it, and then you tie that to your profession or your occupation. So to me, that feels like a student success uh, experience that I would describe over and over again. And maybe as a result, you get a credential, you graduate. So if asked the question again, I would think about it in more ways than we typically, we typically do. So, all right, I promise you four things. With this as a foundation, the goal was to set us up to a place to say, if we know what students are saying they want, if we know what success looks like, if we know what campuses have the capacity to do and where the limitations are, what are some four simple things, Amelia, that we can put to, to undergird all of this, to wrap around all of this, and hopefully provide a recipe for student-centered design? Here is my best thinking on a Friday morning for you all here. I would say we need integrated learning records to go along with that. So the first one is that we need clear communication about student success. Number two, integrated learning records. And so this is a place where I think we're probably going to see more movement in the future. Now, you've probably heard about comprehensive learner records. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, the, the evolution of the transcript, so the idea that you would have this uh, document that has courses taken, credit hours earned, grades acquired, things like that. That's going to be there, but I think today's students need a little bit more to describe what, what they're actually doing. So this picture here represents that. What about the person who has a great skill in the arts, but they're also doing some things in the classroom? There should be no reason why their skills and abilities actually don't cover both of those areas. And so I'll even maybe push it a little bit and say I was in a recent uh, conference and someone said, what if we did away with the term co-curriculum? And it was a student affairs uh, conference. Everybody in the room kind of gasped and like, oh, how would you say that? Um, the idea was, what if we just had one curriculum? What if it was one curriculum and students navigated throughout the whole thing and some of their learning happened in the classroom, some of their learning happened outside the classroom? I don't know if we're quite there at that point yet for everybody to adopt it, but I do think it's a place we're going in the future. So that 2018 definition of student success, I made this statement that higher education is an avenue for students to become more engaged citizens, contributors to the public good, and advocates for themselves and others. And if we can prepare students to take on those roles and earn a credential, they will experience the kinds of success during and after college they deserve. And so if you're thinking about it in that sense, the bar is much higher now. It's not enough to just get a credential. How do you know that you've actually been able to weave in and out of that experience and pick up all the skills and competencies and make friends and figure out your purpose and all those things? And so now I would say that this learning happens everywhere notion is the future. I really do think so. I think in the next five years or so, we'll have more conversations about the evolution of learning records to a place where you'll see more campuses saying, what can we do to go beyond the transcript? So if you're curious about this, I would tell you that one simple Google search of comprehensive learner records will unearth a lot of information about a project that ACRO, which is the um, Association for Registrars and Admissions Officers, and NASPA, which is Student Affairs, and then NILOA, which is another organization that looks at learning outcomes. We partnered and worked with over 100 campuses, and we asked them, how would you redo your transcript? Now, if anybody knows your local registrar, uh, approach this gently. Okay, the last thing you want to do is go to the registrar and say, hey, I got an idea. I think you know how that conversation would go. I was thinking we just do away with the whole transcript and just start from scratch, and they'll say, uh, no, you, no, you won't be doing that. That's my transcript, and uh, we, we'll talk about that in a different way. But what I do think is happening is that there will probably be more instances than not when an employer says, hey, I'm looking for someone to fill this new role. I need to do a job advertisement. Rarely do you see, please submit copies of your most recent transcript. Now, if you're going to graduate school and you're majoring in a profession where you need that, absolutely. But in most cases, they just want to know, do you have the skills and abilities to perform the duties of the job? So you need something more than something that just says the number of credit hours you've earned. So we've had a, a little bit of a journey, I would say. Uh, the first reaction from registrars was, you really want to muddy up my pristine uh, your transcript and put all these non-academic course-bearing, uh, grade-bearing things on the, on the transcript, to which it was to say, no, this should probably be supplemental. So right now, I think we have two things existing. You have your traditional transcript, and then you have e-portfolios, digital badges, and you have um, all sorts of places where you can put extracurricular, co-curricular, additional things in there. Um, but I think eventually we'll start to see those things merge, and you'll start to see one learning record, or learning and employment record, which is a new term that's emerging here. So the thing about these is that they're most often all digital, so there's no paper. They're always developed in some type of collaborative fashion between academic affairs, student affairs, a little bit of the registrars, hopefully a little bit of the, uh, the IR department or data folks, if you think about it in that fashion. And they should be transferable. 
So maybe I went to D2L University and I want to transfer to NASPA University. Some of those skills and competencies should be measured in a way with outcomes that actually transfer across the board. So if any of this sounds like it resonates with you, you're in, you're in good space. If it seems a little foreign, I think that's where we're going. But the reason I say that's part of the recipe is because today's student, the student of tomorrow, they're going to see higher education or education in general as this wide open space. And they might pick up some things from the job, make up, pick up some things from college, they might pick up some things in other places. They need a place that can put all of this together. So that record, um, some would say blockchain was going to be the way to connect all that together. But the future, I think, is that to accept that learning happens everywhere and these integrated learning records are the future of where we're going. So that has to be part of the recipe, along with pretty clear communication about where we're going and why. So you got two, and I got two more. Tailored flexibility. You all can tell I like pictures. I'm trying to be literal with it. So when I think of a good tailor, and I'm someone who's tall, so all of my jackets always stop at the wrist so you can see what time it is, the type of thing. Um, I can either take them out somewhere, I can let them up and make them three quarters. But when you have a good tailor, someone can bring the back of the jacket in and it still fits uniquely to you, but it's consistent enough that everybody else who wears the jacket, you fit right in. Similarly, I would say for students, they want an experience that feels tailored enough for them, but also not so unique that they don't fit into what's going on. So what I would say here by tailored flexibility is you need a critical function that probably wraps around every single one of the experiences that students are in, and I think that area is advising. So some recent data from the Future of Privacy Forum about college students' attitudes toward data privacy. Now I had to sprinkle this in because I'm not talking about student success. I love talking about data-related things. And so these two data points stuck out to me. 71% of students said they believe they should have the right to control how their colleges use data about them. See some heads nodding? Okay. 61% also said they trust their institution's learning and advising management systems to protect their personal information. I would have expected the number to be a little bit lower, but when I see these two together, you're like, Amelia, what does that relate to in terms of tailored you know, flexibility? What I see here is if 71% of students say they feel like they should have the right to control, and 61% say they actually think that their institution can protect their personal information, to me that means they want to have a conversation. They want to be involved in the conversation. They want someone who's going to be able to say to them, how do you plan to produce whatever skills and abilities now and beyond, and how can we help you get there? So I think that advising may end up being one of the next high impact practices for higher education. So it's not a prediction, and don't quote me on this, but I wouldn't be surprised if the evolution of the advising function starts to be more holistic to the point where every student who experiences that one-on-one -on -one or that chatbot or a combination that interactivity mix will probably say that was one of the most integral places for them to experience college because they need to make their biggest decisions and they're interpreting a lot of information and they're realizing the scope and scale of things and they need to commit to something and they want to actually produce something in the end. So I want to give you a free resource that's available. Uh, NASPA has an advising success network and it's, it's a brief. It's a brief that says misunderstanding your students, approaches to affirming students' identities. And I put this in here because if I'm thinking that advising is critical, and this is my first D2L meeting, imagine if I didn't know Christy, I said, hey, Christy, can you tell me a little bit about this D2L experience and how I can have it be the best? And she said, don't talk to anybody. Nobody knows anything. Just go pick a session and learn for yourself. I said, ooh, that's really sharp advice. You know, I don't know if I really fit in here type of thing. But if Christy said, hey, it's a really great experience, although Christy probably would say that because Christy works with D2L, but if she said, it's a really great experience, follow me, let me introduce you to some people who are here to learn some additional things. You should go to this session, you should go to that session. But yet, let's pull up the mobile app, let me show you some things. That one experience and how it went for me could be the difference between me coming back to the D2L conference year after year. Very cheesy example. Similarly, this brief talks about the many ways you could misunderstand your students. And so I'm taking this from a particular standpoint of student identity, but imagine that one single conversation where someone misgenders you. You've told them what your pronouns are, and they don't necessarily respect it, they don't want to do it. That could be the difference between them saying, I don't know if I want to come to this university anymore. And I'm putting a lot on it, because at the end of the day, if that tailored flexibility, that idea that a student should be able to come to the campus and have the type of tailoring experience that makes them feel like they're unique, but also broad enough that they can fit right in, the difference between someone respecting, affirming, welcoming their identity could be that one thing that makes them say, I'm going to take the whole jacket off. I'm done with the whole experience. And the stakes are too high right now because remember those top issues that we had? One of them is the retaining of students. And so I leave you with number four. What goes better together than peanut butter and jelly? And so it's a nice way to say partnership. In this case, if you're working in K-12, you're working in higher ed, you got to have a lot of people all involved. Now, some would say peanut butter by itself is just fine. I would be one of those people. I don't like peanut butter and jelly. Um, but some who do say peanut butter and jelly go better together. What I mean by that literally is one of the biggest divides, and I hope I don't touch a nerve with anybody, is that academic affairs and student affairs partnership on a campus. 
On some campuses, it looks like this. On other campuses, it looks like these two pieces of bread. Even though I'm not really a big fan of peanut butter and jelly, I do think they are better together than apart. And what I mean by that is, during the pandemic, we all learned a lot about how to mobilize really quickly to solve students' issues. And I think there were some things that we tried that worked so well that we decided to keep them. And so I want to give you another example of that. It's a resource. So we did a bit of a, I want to say, a, I guess we said an award ceremony during the pandemic to find campuses that during the pandemic had actually scurried, um, really shuffled, I'm trying to think of another S word, really, really worked hard to try to put together as much as they could to serve students across a variety of student services when they couldn't be together in person. And so we found 10 of them that did it so well that we, we gave them a, a humble award, a monetary cash award, and then asked them, would they share with us? Would they tell us what actually worked? And the through line for every one of those campuses, whether they were community colleges, whether they were four-year public, four-year private, as they all said, this would not have worked if we didn't have the partnership across the entire campus. And you probably say, okay, we knew that already. It's not really a big deal. But I would say this planning guide, this link here, if you were to go to this link, you'll see that their types of collaboration and partnership spanned everything from just trying new things. So how could you use a platform that's supposed to be used for web conferencing to create a virtual lobby, that was something they did, to how would he have an actual holistic approach? How could the student who comes to that virtual lobby for advising get advice around everything from their academic progress to their financial decisions to their career aspirations, things of that sort. So even strategic technology use, the idea that they would be making decisions, probably not buying new things, but how can they actually share across the board uh, was a huge thing. And so the idea that this partnership piece is almost to say if there were four of these strategies, which one would I put at the top? It would have to be this one. I don't know that any particular effort or recipe for student success would work if there were no partnerships across that. And I think you all probably would agree. I hope that you would. All right. So I promised that I would not lecture you too long. And we literally have about 14 minutes to go. So I want to get some reactions and questions from you. But I want to leave you with these additional considerations. So I started off with a cheesy analogy about a recipe. And I said that the recipe for success would have these ingredients and talked about the analogy between flavor and texture and reproducibility. And I can see someone saying, that's really nice, Amelia, but my apple pie recipe is the best. And that's that. You know, I don't, I don't have anything else to say about that. At some point, I want to acknowledge a few things that are outside the scope of this very general analogy that I've made here. And these are things that I would give as advice to anybody. The first is promoting the unique institutional characteristic that you have. And what I mean by that is, if you're a big state university and you pride yourself on a particular mission, keep that mission. And if that recipe that you're using is very different from somebody else's, that's totally okay. To know your brand, to know your audience is an absolutely appropriate thing. And I would say we're in a place now where competition is higher than ever. And it's very tempting to try to mimic or replicate to the point of losing your own mission and your own identity. So I want to bring that back. The second is addressing the needs of faculty, administrators, and staff. And I would imagine that if you all have come to this conference, you're balancing a lot of things like me. You got personal things you're doing, you got professional things you're doing, you got your own career aspirations. We spend all this time talking about students. When do we pour back into the faculty and administrators and professionals themselves who are doing this really hard work? I mentioned the great resignation. You know, some of you know somebody who knows somebody who was a part of that. Or maybe you yourself are thinking about a career pivot. Um, the point is, addressing those needs are just as essential as addressing the needs of students. So this is a session about students, but I didn't want to leave out the part about the professionals. The third is an appropriate pace for change. Uh, I talk fast just naturally. I like to go really quickly. I ran track in college. It's my nature to move quickly. Canvases are like that too. And oftentimes you see that new technology, you see that new initiative, you see that brand new press release about this thing that happened and you call together the group and you say, we need to buy this, we need to do this thing. Um, I would say slow down is my best advice. Um, change doesn't happen overnight. And I know that higher education gets critiqued for a slow pace of change, but sometimes fast is not always the best way to go. And then fourth, avoiding the pitfalls of data-informed strategies. And you might say, what are those pitfalls, Amelia? And what I would tell you is that anytime I talk to a campus that says we want to be data-driven or data-informed, I would say, tell me what you think is the biggest hindrance for you to get there. And most often you think they would say something like, well, we just need more training. We need somebody to come in and talk to us about how to build better data literacy and we need to bring in some other guests and experts and things like that. And that's fine. Others would say, we need a new platform. We need some new analysis software. If we buy that, we can get into it. But number one, two, and three, reasons why campuses do not adopt a data-informed culture are not those two things. Number one, competition. The idea that Christie's area has been the highest performing over the last three years, and if I were to learn a little bit more about the data that she's using, I might become the new number one. And Christie says, I can't have that happen. And so data will not flow between Christie and me because there can only be one number one. Similarly, if you put two particular areas and competition with each other for resources is chaos. Automatically, that's the recipe for chaos. I know this would never be one of your campuses, but it does happen. Number two, 
politics, the idea that the secret side deal, can you come to this meeting, I'll come to that meeting, and you're like, Amelia, how does that fit into a recipe for student success? These are the detractors, the small threads, if you don't pull on them, you will probably be fine, but if you do, it unravels the whole thing. So the idea that you would have separate committees, uh, meetings that happen in silos that nobody knows about, those types of things. And the third is just denial. I've, I've talked to many campuses that had their, their glory days, the days when things were really good and are in denial that those things are not in place anymore. Or the student survey that says one in two students did not have a good experience with the dining hall. And someone says, but the other half they did. And so this ongoing cycle of whether to trust the data or not and be in denial, because he had not. And then the last one, I can't be an optimist without saying that the biggest consideration I would leave any of you with is to celebrate progress in the interim. This is really hard work. This is work that takes a long time. This is work that doesn't have a clear recipe that can be replicable all the time. But at some point, we're going to have some quick wins. We made it through a whole conference. We've gone to a number of meetings about things. We're halfway through the fiscal year for most of us, or starting a new fiscal year, halfway through a calendar year. And at some point, these interim steps along the way all add up to the level of student success that would probably be the best recipe that I would offer anybody. So we need to celebrate. So literally, my last slide is to leave you with some resources that I find to be helpful. So if any of this cheesy analogy about student success and recipes uh, seem interesting to you, here are three books that I would recommend highly. Um, you might have heard about the Student Ready College book. It was the uh, first edition that came out, the idea to flip the question about whether or not students are ready for college, but instead whether colleges are ready for students. Got, got great, great acclaim, great success. The second edition is out now, so uh, uh, the same authors there. Um, the second is Reframing Assessment to Center Equity, Theories, Models, and Practices. And this book is a bit of uh, a set of case studies that goes across all different aspects of the campus from in the classroom to outside the classroom. And if you're looking for a really good model for assessment that centers equity and practices and theories, I think you would enjoy that one. And then the last one is an updated book about student development theory. So if you ever find yourself talking about how to pull in some of those aspects of advising that I mentioned, some of those other things, but in a more contemporary fashion, this is a book that's called Square Pegs and Round Holes. I think you'll find it to be Really good, so according to my time, right on time, I think about nine minutes, uh, I've talked to you a lot about a lot of things in a lot of different areas. I would love to have any reactions, questions, I wanna talk about anything, anything related to higher ed, current state of things, student success, your reactions to the definition, any of that. So uh, we got nine minutes, would love to hear from you. What you thinking? Wait, aside from my picture, I wanna say what you thinking, what, what do you think about that? No, no. I think I'm gonna go back to the slide. Yeah, what you got? My new friend from, from Connecticut. Right, right. Um, I, first, I, I wanna say I absolutely agree with everything you Thank you. Second, I also wanna absolutely disagree with you. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I would probably, was that, that a question or is it a reaction? It's just kind of, it's just kind of an observation. Yeah. Because like, I don't disagree with anything that you said. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think that there's, there's aspects of uh, higher education needs to be all these things. But what do you want to come away with? You? Sure. You know, what do you want to come away with higher education? I've got a son, 14, who's starting high school right now. Um, I want him to go into college, or I want him to come out of college with confidence even when he's not. Mm -hmm. with the ability to take risks, even though he might have Yeah. Um, and those are the skills that I want him to do. I don't, I don't care what, what he chooses to go into. I don't care if he goes into a number of different places and fails in every one of them, yeah. as long as he can try. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that's what I want to come up with. I like the idea of, of resilience as the anecdote for a narrative that failure is not allowed. Um, and I think that can actually coexist. You know, believe it or not, I, I don't think that today's definitions of failure equal, I had to change my major, so I'm all of a sudden a failure in college. Or I had to take a break, so all of a sudden I failed, something like that. But I do think, this is what I see as this interesting push and pull about what you said. So, so I agree too. Well, that's what I did. I 
Right. Yeah, this, this, is, this is how I would describe it. And in some ways, um, it's safe to say not everybody will choose to go to college. And there was a time when I felt very, very bad about that. Like, why wouldn't everybody choose to go? There is absolutely a path to whatever your version of success that doesn't involve you actually enrolling in college, and you'd be totally fine. I don't think the goal is to convince everybody to go, but I do think the goal is that for those that choose to go, they should have the best experience possible. I would also say that the goal of, you know, to the point earlier, the earlier poll of um, success equals completion, if someone decides to go to college for two years and they've gotten what they need to go uh, and they can make a successful life after that, that'd probably be okay. I think the narrative of failure is this idea that it's an either or. Either you did the thing or you, you didn't do the thing. Um, and depending on who you're talking to in the profile of the student, some would say they don't have the luxury of, of not achieving or not reaching that goal. And so I think there's a long, a long line of ways we could approach this. But the reason I put this slide up here is I actually think what you're describing is it goes into the number one and number two. So when someone tries something, maybe they choose a major, it doesn't work out. It's because they've learned more about what they want to do. And they say, hey, this is not for me, or I've tried something that doesn't really work out. That means I have a little bit more time. Um, but no, I, I think it's a fair critique. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have problems with that at all. We got, okay, we got two more reactions. So I think in the back, you first, and then we'll come over here. What you got? Yes. Right? Um, and so that's kind of tied to this idea of how everything really works better when we collaborate. So what practices have you seen that can get that to actually occur? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, because that sort of, like, everybody's so scared of failing that they don't want to get be the ones that um, Absolutely. can kind of take that blame. Mm -hmm. so Oh, it's a, it's a real thing, and I'm gonna see if I can answer it succinctly so we can get to the second question. Um, but you're right, though. I think it, the, the best advice I have in terms of where you get started, I think it's an actual clarity of the goal or clarity of the issue you're trying to solve. So I don't know that I've met anybody who's out here saying, I'm just here to waste as many resources as possible and take as long as possible and never get to the end. And I plan to do this for the next 20 years of my career. Like, no, I think everybody right now wants to find that thing, that one solution, and get there quickly uh, because the stakes are so high. You know, costs continue to rise, all those things. Um, but what I think it probably could come down to, if, if and I agree, and thank you for it, um, it's almost like you're saying peanut butter and jelly you know, go together. Um, but the place I would start is if you have the fortunate scenario of academic affairs and student affairs at the table together, I think I would start off with a, with a frank conversation to say if we had to list our maybe top three indicators that something needs to change, what would you say that might be? And the way they probably describe it won't necessarily pit academic affairs against student affairs. They might truly say our biggest issue right now is related to the health and well-being of students, probably their mental health. That shows up in the classroom this way, it shows up outside the classroom this way. What might we do together and what resources and data do we have to collaborate with to further examine the issue? And that might drive what type of interventions they do. That way there's a little piece of it that belongs to everybody. Now I know the challenge is like, well if everybody's involved and nobody's leading, but on the flip side, it lessens that fear of failure and that big stakes of like, if this thing doesn't work, um, then what's gonna happen? The second piece of advice is, don't rush to go out and buy something uh, new to mine your data. There's a good chance that you could use the data that you already have and probably start there and then invest after you've done your first round. But that's, that's a whole separate conversation about how to use data to inform your strategies. But um, I agree. And I, I think it's, it's part the clarity of the issue thing. And second, I'd probably say leadership. You know, I would, I would love to do a separate conversation with VPs and presidents who put the pressure on so heavy that nobody wants to try anything because they don't want to get fired. So yeah, you're like, yeah, that does me. Um, yeah, tell them to call me. I'm working on a campus, so I can, <laughs> I can probably talk to them. All right, second question. Oh, third question. What you got? You had your, you had your hand raised? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, model students that and then see if you can Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
Absolutely. It's, it's the reason I connected it to number two, which was the integrated learning records. I'm not going to say this is a solution for failure or the solution for this idea that not getting the 4.0 would actually be an okay thing. But the ePortfolio, for example, is a tool for reflection, but also a tool to capture everything that you're learning. So imagine you were that student who came from another country and your average is a 3.5, but they wanted a 4.0. The first narrative is like, I failed. I didn't get a perfect score. But if they were along the way developing a portfolio, let's say they were an engineering major and they have a whole lot of artifacts over that four years that shows everything from internship experiences to practicum, to papers they've written, to demonstrations of all of what they know in their particular field, they could hand that over, show that to a graduate program or someone else who says, hey, if all of this came together in a student with a 3.5, this is not failure. This is actually a try and rinse and repeat effort that along the way built a number of stackable experiences that the student could narrate on their own. Um, but that has to be tied with the tailored flexibility. You have to have a coach, someone who's working to say, hey, how would you tell this story of what feels like failure to you, but is actually success because you now have committed to a profession, you tried some things in an iterative fashion, and now this collection of experiences showcases all of what you know and what you can do. So it's the reason I think that um, advising will probably be the next high impact practice, but paired with some type of integrated learning record, you take the mystery out of what a 4.0 represents. Because on the flip side, you could have a student who's just a really, really good test taker, you know, they're good at preparing for exams, but when you ask them, tell me what you learned as a biology major, they stumble a little bit. And so I would take the 3.5 with a really full set of narratives of experiences over the 4.0 that says I'm still trying to figure it out. Neither of those is failure, it's just a room for improvement. I think that that integration of learning and experiences, if intentionally done, could get there. So I don't know how that you know, seems like a response to you, but I think that would be a way to go. Yeah. Wow. Anything else, any passing words, any predictions? I got one, in case you're curious about the future of higher education before we go. I think we're right at time, 10.35 on the dot. Here's my prediction, and I, I wish we could get together a year from now. I do not think that AI will replace human decision making. I just need to say it. I don't think that we're gonna become extinct. I do not think that we're gonna be in a place where AI is gonna replace everything. I do, however, think that it's gonna create a new discussion about the jobs for the future. So the analogy I would give is when this happened in manufacturing, let's say you worked in an automotive plant and you were the person who attached the handles to doors um, and that was your job every day. And at some point there was some type of uh, machine that could do that for you. Many would say, I'm out of a job now because who's gonna be attaching the, the handles? It's gonna be a robot. I haven't lost my job, my job just changed. I now have to learn how to program the machine that puts the handles on the doors. I wonder if higher education or education in general will keep pace to be able to create the new types of training for the jobs of the future. So I'm not necessarily concerned about AI, I'm concerned about the types of roles and skill sets that we'll need to manage AI, like those who would produce the prompts for uh, ChatGPT. And if we don't keep pace, failure will look a whole lot different for higher education. It'll be less about whether these programs and services work, but instead to be prepared them for the jobs that are coming. So how about that for an ending of a very holistic recipe for student-centered design. So um, I'm gonna skip back, sorry for the fast tracking. If you wanna talk more, that's my email address. I, I still have the, the, the landline phone, but I rarely you know, get calls on it. But I would love to stay in touch. Thank you very much for coming and I uh, wish you a good rest of the conference.